chapter six. Um, this meeting is held in the Rosa Park High School Auditorium. It is an open pub public open session of the Rosa Park Board of Education held under the Open Public Meetings Act of the state of New Jersey. Notice of this meeting was sent to the Star Ledger, the local sources, the Home News Tribune, the borough clerk, school offices, and the district website. Roll call, please. President Holmes. Here. Vice President Baimante. Here. Susan Carstorm. Here. Mr. Figueredo. Here. Dr. Brittany Kirkland. Cindy Mago. Here. Jennifer McCarr. Here. Chris Morrow. Here. Constance Quintella. Here. We have a quorum. Please arise for a flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And let it be resolved that the Rosa Park Board of Education meeting hereby convenes to executive session for the discussion of the following subjects. Personnel matters, attorney client privilege. It is anticipated that the executive session will take approximately 60 minutes. The board may take action during public session. The board shall return to public session following executive session at approximately 7 p.m. The minutes of the executive session shall be released to the public when the reason for the executive session no longer exists. Do I have a motion to go into executive? I'll make. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are now in executive session. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, can I have a motion to go back in the open? I'll make that motion. I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. We are back, back in open. Um, at this time, what I'll do is I'll open up the uh, public portion for agenda items only. As I say, agenda items only. And you can come up, state your name and the town that you're from. And uh, you have three minutes to speak. I think I need to be a little taller. <laughs> Hi, good evening. I'm Kathleen Paiva. I'm from 124 Union Road. And I have a few questions. Um, on page 20, it talks about the legal fees for the new lawyer, 152000 I was curious how much the old law firm would charge our district. Mm -hmm. um, on page 19... For the budget, it says clearly states taxes to be raised twenty three million six hundred and thirty six thousand six hundred and seventy dollars. Is taxes to be raised a typo, or is is that the tax burden overall for the entire town? And then my other question was on page fourteen, the harassment and bullying incidents. My daughter, as a parent of a of a child that was bullied. How do we know? I mean, I don't want personal information. I don't obviously think we should be disclosed that, but I think parents should be allowed to know what type of incidents are going on. Is it verbal harassment? Is it targeted? Um, is it physical? Um, we obviously want to make sure our kids are in a safe environment going to school every day. Um, <clears throat> my other fourth thing on page three, your personnel. Um, I just wanted to mention on the record, congrats uh, to Mrs. Goyce on um, her superintendent position. Um, my daughter and I are going to severely miss her at the middle school. She has my heart. And when I tell you she is everything to my daughter, I'm not even kidding. Um, any issues I've had with, my, uh, with kids in the school, bothering my daughter, harassing her, bullying her, Mrs. Goyce has been there every minute for me. And from the bottom of my heart, I think this is probably one of the best decisions you guys have made. And I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Good evening, Jackie Garcia, 600 Laurel Avenue. 
um, the agenda item number one, appointment of district superintendent. I also wanted to echo um, the previous uh, young lady who talked about Principal Goyce. Since meeting her, she has been so great. Um, not only do I see how dedicated she is to the students, the middle school, but each individual child. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. We're certainly very happy that the district is appointing her as superintendent, but I wish you well, Mr. Garrido. I'm, first, thank you for all of the work that you've done and all the years that you've put in. But Principal Goyce is an excellent choice. Um, from the words of my daughter today, she's the best. So that's all I wanted to mention. And one last thing, if I had a question on the budget, is there a public portion for that? Okay, thank you. Thank you. At this time, I will close the public portion on agenda items only. I will move into any committee reports. President Harms, I have a brief uh, committee report. On uh, this past Thursday, April 20th, the CPEG uh, committee met uh, virtually, and Mrs. Marmello, the interim director of special services, gave an update to the parents who attended. And then the parents were able to have a round table and the next meeting will take place. I believe it's going to be May 18th. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Um, I met with the high school PTA meeting last night, which was great. Um, they are doing nominations for their new board next year. I believe it's going out to all the eighth grade parents and the high school parents for their PTA nominations. Um, also, Thursday is Take Your Child to Work Day, and the band Tricky Tray is this Saturday, and I believe tickets are still available, so please help them out and join the band in their Tricky Tray. And last, the second week of May is Teacher Appreciation, May 8th through the 12th, so if you have any donations to send in to make baskets, please do so. Thank you. Any other? President Harms, I have a couple of reports on the Barbara Gordon PTA was um, earlier in April, and they are actually the recipient of the 2022-2023 uh, New Jersey PTA President's Recognition Award. Um, we're currently doing our spring Graham fundraiser, so I think you can reach out to anyone in the PTA if you'd want to get a Graham, a spring Graham. The talent show is tomorrow, April 25th. The neon party for parents is this Friday. So it's an adult only party. It's on April 28th. And the next meeting is May 4th, 7.30. Um, also, we had a technology committee meeting earlier and just a couple of accomplishments that the district has to uh, report on. We have new cameras on buses, cameras at the exterior of Al Dean, Sherman, and Robert Gordon schools, and at the Board of Ed uh, building. And we're also working on a district app for everyone, parents, and for administration. And the last thing is we're working on implementation of online payment, which is actually, that's already in progress, and it's through Genesis for payments related to activity fees. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Yes, I have a report from the middle school PTA. Um, just note that their teacher appreciation week is the first week of May, May 1st through 5th. They're still looking for donations. Um, another reminder, the eighth grade, <clears throat> excuse me, the eighth grade dance is now June 13th instead of the 6th due to uh, primary day. We're closed now. And the eighth grade graduation, I know it's not till June, but it is June 19th. And then just for all of the PTAs, not just middle school, all the PTAs, PTOs, and PTSAs are doing a little Caesar stock up for summer fundraiser. So you can contact any of the school parent groups for orders. Anyone else? Yes, President Harms. Um, I want to just thank uh, Aldine PTO for a great tricky tray a few weeks ago. Um, they're having a, also a movie night this Friday. And I also want to let everyone know about 
the high school um, at Roosevelt Park High School uh, fundraiser for the class of 2024. They're having a wrestling match on Saturday, May 6th for everyone to come check out. That's all. Thank you. And I didn't win anything at that tricky truck. Nothing. Any other? Yes, I would like to remind everybody that tomorrow is the admin um, day. Please take care of all of them since they're all amazing. Thank you. Any other? Sorry, Mr. Harms. <laughs> Apparently, Teacher Appreciation Day at the middle school was moved to the second week, so it's now May 8th. <laughs> okay. Um, if there's no others, we'll move on to the superintendent's uh, report. Mr. Garrido. Thank you, President Harms. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see all of you here tonight. Uh, I do have two items that I wanted to discuss with the audience and with the board members this evening. Uh, both of them are presentations, actually. Uh, I don't know if everyone is aware. Uh, every school district is required uh, to be audited every year annually by an independent auditor. Uh, tonight, uh, we have the company that audits us, us every uh, summer, uh, typically August, September, uh, they come in. So I would like to uh, call up to the podium, uh, Mr. Robert A. Holzer uh, from Robert A. Holzer and Company to report the findings. Thank you, Pedro. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to be brief and just touch on a few things. Um, first of all, uh, overall, the results of the audit were good. Um, even though we had some transitions, the audit went very smoothly, and uh, everybody, you know, in, in the business office was very helpful, making sure we had what we needed to successfully complete our audit and do it in a timely manner. Uh, and we being our financial position at year end, it, it's certainly reasonable. Uh, we're, we're at fund balance at the allowed state amount, but we've also put monies aside to offset future taxation and future budgets. We've also set money aside for future capital needs and maintenance needs, and that's important because that will save us money down the road. We'll have the money to pay for those things that we know are coming, uh, so that's a good uh, fiscal policy, and I'm, I'm glad the board uh, has seen fit to do these things. Um, as I said, things went well. We did have one recommendation. Um, the general fund, we couldn't quite get it into proof at year end. Um, Really, it was more of a timing difference. As everyone knows, we had uh, our business share to leave mid-year. We had an interim. That person left right at June 30th. And then later on, your new BA came on. But there was no one there to really ask questions to because they weren't there. And the new BA was in a, in a tough spot because he didn't really have history with the district. And he was doing his best to get up to speed. So we've always had a history of good financial reporting here in Roselle Park. It's not a major issue, but I just want to make sure it doesn't get away from us hence the purpose of the recommendation. But uh, other than that, as I said, things overall were good and I'd be happy to answer anything about the report or take any questions anyone would have. I guess not. Okay, great. I, I just wanted to say, Pedro, it's been great working with you uh, over the last few years and uh, have a great retirement. Enjoy yourself. I would. <laughs> Thank you so much, no, and thank no. you for all your support as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. You also. Uh, the second item that I have is, is another presentation, is our final budget presentation. Uh, before we begin uh, the, our PowerPoint, I just want to give a little background, um, just, just so everyone has an understanding of what a lengthy uh, and tedious Pro process it is to reach this point here. Uh, the, the budget preparation and the budget planning for the next school year really begins back in November, October, November. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, there are multiple meetings with staff, multiple meetings uh, with the board finance committee uh, to reach a budget uh, that we feel is the best budget uh, to educate our students. Obviously, you know, you're going to see from the presentation uh, that there are contractual obligations. Obviously, uh, we have to set funds uh, apart for salaries and benefits, uh, but the money that is left uh, for our children is spent in the right 
and the most efficient matter. Um, we look at data, and, and when I talk about data, we look at test data, we look at uh, you know, class uh, data in every building. Uh, we meet, uh, our business administrator and myself, we meet with our uh, administration, uh, with staff, we get their input to see what's uh, lacking in the, in the classrooms. And obviously we look at performance uh, to see where we have areas of gaps uh, that we need to fill. And, and our presentation to, uh, today is going to show you the fiscal uh, part of our budget, but also our programs and our education. Uh, piece as well. Um, I will be remiss if, if I do not thank uh, four people at this day at, at the table here, uh, five people actually. Uh, Ms. Susan uh, Kostrom, who's the committee chair for the finance committee. Uh, Ms. Jennifer McCarr, a member of the uh, finance committee. Dr. Brittany Kirkland, also member. Uh, President Harms, who attended every finance committee meeting uh, as well. And of course, our business administrator, administrators, Attila Sagahublu. So, so, and I'm, I'm hope I got, I'm doing a good job. I, I, you know, I have two months left, and I hope one of my goals is to make sure that I can pronounce that, your last name. But uh, I, I really want to thank uh, all of you uh, for your dedication. And, and again, uh, you know, you don't you don't see the some some of the inner working of the budget, but uh, these people really are. Uh, making decisions that are in the best interest of our students. So with that said, I would like to introduce Mr. Sagahoglu uh, to begin the presentation. I'm going to ask the board to please move over to the other side. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me good? Is it lower? Is it lower? Can you hear me good? All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming, uh, taking uh, your time for uh, looking at the budget presentation. Uh, it was a really hard work. It took like more than four months to get together. So it's kind of simplified. We cannot give any details, but you can always reach out to me by phone, email. I'm pretty responsible for the emails. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Uh, I want to thank all the board members, board president, vice president, and all the board members. Next, please. Uh, we are going to talk about the expenditures, revenues, programs, and services, and text of information. I'll start with expenditures and revenues. That Mr. Gerido is going to be going over the programs and services. Then I'll conclude with the text of information. Our expenditures. These are the changes in the expenditures. This is the whole, not whole expenditures. This is just to give you an idea what is different from the uh, last year's budget. So the increase in salaries is $744,000 roughly and increase in benefits, like, which is 12%, $872,000. We have a lot of capital expenditures, which I'm gonna go over it one by one in the next slides. And we, we are planning to buy equipments, which is one school bus and one utility van. Um, and we have a lot of technology upgrades, including staff laptops, replacement servers, Wi-Fi access, and design computers for the high school. So all totals up, uh, up to like $5.5 million, a little over it. These are just the changes. So our overall to total budget is a little over, uh, actually close to $51 million. Uh, the big, biggest expense goes to student programs, which is a really good sign, uh, 56%. Then the next one comes employee benefits, and it goes with the facilities and goes on with the administration. Uh, facilities also very important because if you have like a healthy environment, it helps the students to understand better. Next slide, please. If you talk about the revenues, uh, our local taxes is going up 1.85%. Actually, you know, the uh, cap is 2%. Uh, it's 1.85 because of the debt service is going down every year since we are paying our debt. Um, so state sources goes up 2.8. Uh, this includes the pre-K expansion grant, actually eight. And federal sources, if you can see the grants going down $3 million, this is because of the ESSER funds are gonna be concluding at the, most of my end of this year. 
and the reserves we are uh, using 1.1 million dollars from the capital reserve to support the projects. So if you go see the uh, uh, pie is uh, actually local taxes is the most 46 percent, and right after that state sources comes for 43 percent, the biggest things. This is the purple pool cost. So uh, compared to purple costs uh, coming from the budget software is like a, out of $19,000, uh, the most goes the classroom instruction, $11,000, which is great. Uh, the next one uh, actually comes as like a other expenses and uh, actual, sorry, uh, support services and follows up with the uh, operations and administration. Administration. Next one, please. So our uh, cost per pupil is 1,879, which is the state uh, regional cost limit is $2,443. This is a very good sign because we are not spending a lot for administration. Uh, we, are, we are a little understaffed in administration, so we are trying to ha have different hats and spend most of the money for the children. Our programs, Mr. Greer. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, as I mentioned to you before, uh, once we uh, put aside salaries and benefits, uh, we really look at where we can best uh, find ways to educate our students. So Chris? Teaching and learning. Uh, we've had a, tr a strategic plan a, a few years ago. We have extended that strategic plan and part of it was in teaching and learning. Again, we look at data, we look at classroom needs, we look at many different areas, uh, and one of our uh, areas that we found uh, funding is in our um, state early childhood expansion grant. And that means that for this coming year, uh, we can educate our preschool three and four year olds with um, three additional classrooms that we're planning. That means that there's gonna be 45 additional seats for preschoolers. Uh, right now, we still, have 70 students in our waiting list. We want to educate every student. And this, this is a full uh, day pre-kindergarten uh, where many districts are still having half day uh, kindergarten. So we are ahead of the game here. Uh, we have seven classrooms in our buildings. We are planning three additional for a total of 10 uh, classrooms. Uh, we continue to invest in learning experiences. Uh, we continue to support the Algebra for All Math initiative that we uh, started, I believe, two years ago. Uh, we are going to update our Envision uh, Math program. Uh, is the 2024 uh, version uh, for K-5. to uh, Envision program has been found to be the best math program that exists right now. We are going to uh, invest in that program for a K-5 uh, grade level. A uh, new Spanish curriculum from grades nine to 12 is called Enqu Encuentros uh, Tech Series. Uh, we have a very outdated uh, curriculum right now, so that will be upgraded as well for next year. And we are updating our ELA curriculum to promote diversity and inclusivity. And also we found from our uh, data that writing is where we need to focus. So uh, that's going to be the focus for the 2023-2024 school year. And we're also updating our talented and gifted units uh, that hasn't been updated as well. So we're going to uh, ensure uh, that we educate our talented and gifted students uh, with the best uh, resources available. Uh, continue teaching and learning. A couple of years ago, we started the Project Lead the Way uh, courses, which are STEM-based courses at the middle school and high school. Uh, at the high school, we have Introduction to Engineering Design. Uh, principles of Engineering and Computer Integrated Manufacturing Engineering 3. These are all uh, credit-based courses through RIT, which is Rochester Institute of Technology. So our students pass those courses, they receive credit uh, from uh, RIT in those uh, three courses there. At the middle school, we, we are uh, starting the medical detective um, a program app creators, which is, I know, very popular, science of technology, 
And we're going to continue to expand as the, year, as the years go on because we want to make sure that we invest in technology and STEM, STEM courses, which is the popular uh, courses that we have now. And we have invested in plus over 50 extracurricular activities and clubs in the middle in our high school. Uh, just this past two years, we have made a commitment uh, to, uh, for early college initiative which means that we have uh, advanced placement courses where students can receive college courses through the dual uh, enrollment program. So we're partnering with Fairleigh Dickinson University for dual enrollment uh, courses. Right now we only have two, but we are expanding from those two. Uh, we're also going to, we're looking into uh, partnering with Montclair State University as well uh, for future dual enrollment courses. Uh, seal of biliteracy, we only started a couple of years. Uh, that means that we have students that are highly effective or they have passed uh, the test of uh, biliteracy in two languages. So uh, we have a handful. We are continue to grow as we, as we go on. And the continuation of the medical research uh, through Kane University, this happens in the summer uh, months, is for high school students and is a wonderful uh, program. A few years ago, I visited. Uh, they really create projects that you, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's amazing uh, what they do there. Uh, medical research, cancer research, and all of that they do with, uh, with college professors at uh, King University. And here, we, I just wanted to show, show you a chart. Um, a few years ago, we looked at our school performance report, and we saw that we were very low in college readiness. And as you can see from 2019, actually, uh, the percentage of students in uh, dual enrollment was at zero. Uh, we have now uh, over 10% of our students uh, enrolled in dual enrollment at the high school. And in AP courses offering, uh, we were about 10% in 2019. We have gone up almost to 30% uh, currently. So we're very, very proud of that. And very happy to see that. And again, we want to continue to expand on these two uh, areas. Yes. And here we have our teaching uh, advanced placement courses. We have 18 options for our students. And right now, as I mentioned before, we started with two options, but we will continue to grow as the years uh, move on and as we partner uh, with other colleges as well. Okay, so that gives you an indication. It's just about every content area we have AP courses offering, which really our students uh, benefit from taking. And of course, if they uh, pass the test, that means that they also gain college credits. Uh, we try and we try very hard uh, to support our students. Uh, you know, the, if our students are uh, in need of uh, additional support, whether it's academic or social emotional, we have after school programs. We have a STEM enrichment program. Uh, we have instructional support in both uh, ELA and math, uh, music and arts enrichment, and social emotional learning, which is so critical uh, in today's age. Uh, and then we also have summer programs where we're, we're planning right now our ESL summer program, which I believe last year we had about 40 students enrolled. Uh, so it's quite a big program. Our extended school year program as well. Uh, we had quite a, a high number uh, last year too. Uh, we have credit recovery at the high school uh, where students can recover credit if they fail a course or so. They have an opportunity in the summer to do so and learning remediation uh, programs. And then we also going to be starting Saturday programs in instructional support. And of course, there has to be a combination of academic and athletics to be a uh, very uh, supportive uh, school district. And as you can see, our athletic program for a group one school district, uh, we have quite a few, and we're planning to add one or two more. Uh, I know that volleyball is starting as a club, and now as a uh, uh, team sport at the high school, we may be bringing it down to the middle school as well. So as you can see, our students have opportunities uh, to participate in many uh, athletic uh, teams. And our investment over the last few years, and, and we will continue this, over $800,000 in instructional materials. Uh, we, we, again, we started this process way back in November. We find out from principals, from staff, 
what their needs are. Uh, we are we were very fortunate a few years ago, and, and I tell you we were fortunate. Who knew that a pandemic was going to uh, come our way and that we were going to need to go into remote learning? Uh, we started probably five years ago, so maybe a little bit longer than that, a one-to-one -one device initiative district-wide. Right now, our, uh, we are, even in the elementary school from grades four all the way to 12, one-to-one uh, -one, uh, device um, for, for every student. Our K through third, they are one-to-one, -one, however they keep them in the schools. Again, as I mentioned before, the Project Lead the Way STEM courses at the middle school and the high school, uh, early college initiative, uh, advanced placement, as well as dual enrollment. And every year we update our curriculum and revise district-wide. We don't wanna fall behind. There's always a five-year cycle and we make sure that our curriculum is up to par with, of, of course, the, uh, the ages. And some of the support services, we have school counselors at every building. Um, we had it, uh, another school counselor just a few years ago at the middle school. Uh, we only had one. Uh, we have two counselors now. Uh, related services, we offer our students as much opportunity for related services. Uh, we have social workers, instructional coaches, college and career readiness program, uh, as you saw from the high school uh, curriculum. We have a crisis center at the high school. And we're hoping to start also a crisis center at the middle school. I know the needs there are really calling for one. Uh, character education programs throughout the school district, social emotional learning, mindfulness, uh, a multi-tiered system of support program where we uh, can support every student that is uh, struggling academically. And then of course we have an intervention and referral services for those students that are really struggling in the classroom. Uh, we set committees uh, and these committees are counselors, teachers, parents, administrator, to find ways to intervene and accommodate those students' needs. And more, uh, we, we cannot have the programs that we have unless we train our teachers. And, and we, we really uh, pride ourselves in the professional development and the staff uh, training that we provide for our teachers every year. Uh, Mr. Savala, the director of um, instruction and curriculum, he uh, is in charge and responsible for professional development. And every year there's a full uh, plan uh, for, uh, for staff training. Uh, some of the staff training this past year and some that are being also planned is an equity, advanced play placement institute, project lead the way, because those are the, the um, projects that we have, instructional strategies, best practices, multi-tier system of support, the MTSS uh, system, social emotional learning, ESL strategies, and virtual learning, of course, we can uh, always, we can't forget that we need to continue training uh, because we never know uh, if we have to return to remote. Plus, there's some remote uh, teaching that goes on uh, as well. Chris? And I'm going to pass it right back uh, to our business administrator uh, to go with a safe and secure uh, learning environment. Uh, one thing that I wanted to add as well, uh, we haven't forgot done about security in our buildings, uh, although that was not in our slides. Uh, one of the things that we are planning uh, as well this year is to add more uh, SROs, which are the, our security uh, resource officers. We have one full-time at, at the high school. Uh, we already budgeted for the middle school, but we are working and planning and trying to fund uh, security offices at the elementary schools. We, we can never uh, lay our uh, pumps down and we have to make sure that we provide a safe and secure environment for all of our students. Thank you. Uh, the very first one, uh, actually in the previous slides, I was talking about this HVAC upgrades. Uh, this is like a over $5 million project. Some portion is going to be starting this year. Uh, some portion is going to be next year. So mostly it's going to be funded from the ESSER funds. And also we're going to be using $1.1 million from the capital reserve. And it includes all the school buildings. So it's going to be a major upgrade and it's going to be clean air. Air quality is going to be much better. That's the goal. And the boiler replacements, there's a program by the state. Uh, there's a certain percentage. We get it back as a rebate. 
So that's the time for the boiler replacement and it's gonna be efficiency uh, going forward. We're gonna be saving money with that. Uh, middle school security door installation is gonna be outside of school. So uh, because of the car traffic over there, maybe you already know. Uh, and all the uh, elementary school bedroom upgrades, uh, they need to be updated. Parking last fee payments is like a most likely yearly maintenance kind of project. And lighting upgrades also, we are switching to LEDs, uh, which we're gonna be saving money going forward. Okay, these are all the projects with HVAC upgrades shows as 2.4, but we are spending another couple million dollars from this year. And you can see that how much is gonna be total cost for all this week. Okay. And this is the most important local tax levy. Uh, you can see that how much the increase like every year from 2019 to now. A um, couple of years because of COVID, they, there wasn't that need that much for increase because the school was closed. There wasn't that many expenses, no utility bills, this kind of stuff. But this year is the time for the increase. Next one, please. Uh, actually, tax levy information we compare to last year all the time. Uh, when I say last year, actually this year, and next year is 23, 24. There was a, a mistake at the last year's presentation. So we had the corrected version for 22, 23. Uh, but it didn't affect anything, just to let you know, it was just a mistake on the slides. So when we compare, I wanna make sure it's the corrected amount. So average $250,000 house, uh, the difference is gonna be $125.83 per year, which is little over $10 a month. And we can get all the things happen that we talk about today. Um, I, that's it. And thank you very much. Uh, you know, without your support, we wouldn't be here. We really appreciate your support. Thank you. No. Yes, it's up to you. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to open up the public portion for the budget only. The only thing I ask is that if you make a comment, if you have any questions, we really can't communicate back and forth. So if you have any questions, um, please call Mr. Garrido or Attila and they can help you out better than what we're going to try to do here uh, by that. So if anybody wants to make any comment on the budget, please come forward, state and the town the town that you're from, and you have three minutes to speak. Uh, Katie McDermott, Roselle Park, New Jersey. Um, I haven't been very good at thanking you guys for your dedication to the students of Roselle Park, and I really do appreciate every one of you and the time you put into being school board members, so thank you. I have a number of comments, and I do have some questions that I already wrote out, so I'm still going to ask them, okay? Um, thank you for posting the advertised budget earlier than in past years. It's a step in the right direction, and it definitely made me feel more valued as a parent and community member. However, just as in previous years, we are in a situation where the public hearing is the same night as the vote to approve the budget. Um, the community is once again hamstrung with any comments or concerns brought forward tonight unactionable. As you know from my emails, I am aware of the tight state budget timelines. However, other districts provide much more detailed budgets earlier in the process and hold separate public forums before the vote to approve the budget. So I would ask you to think about doing that again moving forward. Um, the information provided prior to tonight and even the budget that was provided tonight isn't really adequate to glean like real the real impact of what the budget means to our students and the associated programs um i took the pdf imported it into power query and added some variance columns so it would be easier for me to look at and so that's showing the difference between uh last year and then what's projected for next year so my questions um i see that the special education instruction budget is projected to be down seven percent over last year while we have an increase of full-time special education students of 17 percent i would love to see how that difference came about 
I also see an increase in speech, OT, and related services of 25%, which is awesome. But what does that mean? Is that additional therapist, full-time therapist, part-time therapist? Did some of the instructional budget get moved, get allocated to the OT, PT related services budget? I don't know because I don't have the information. Um, same goes for the child study team. We have an increase of 9% and we've advocated for additional child, uh, additional case managers because they are overloaded. Their caseload is way too much, um, but I don't know what that 9% represents. Um, special uh, comment, special education children make up about 17.5% of the on-roll full-time students. That number is going to continue to go up and the budget needs to reflect that growing need. Uh, Second to last thing, I don't know if this is a software issue, but on the advertised budget under IDEA Part B, the term handicapped is used. That term should not be used anymore. If it's a software issue, maybe contact the software developer, but that's an outdated term that shouldn't be used. Um, and then another question, where are these pre-K classrooms going to be housed? I, don't, I can't imagine where we have the space for it. So. I'm sorry, but your time is up. That was it. So great. Okay, Thank you. perfect. <laughs> Jackie Garcia, 600 Laurel Avenue. Um, I have a quick question on page 25 of the budget, specifically on the capital projects. Year after year, I come up here and I specifically request to have actual, or maybe just even estimated start dates to a lot of these projects, only because I've seen a recurring pattern of having the same projects on the budget year after year. So I know how things work. Sometimes they don't get you know, constructed or something gets pushed back. But is there any way that you could provide actual clarification as to uh, when and where these projects are going to be completed? For example, um, March 22nd of last year, um, as part of the meeting minutes, we talked about the middle school doors also being replaced. So I just want to make sure that these projects are happening and when they're happening. Um, similarly, the HVAC system, I think it showed 2.5 million, but you quoted $5 million. So part of that was going to be uh, ESSER funding. So how was the decision made to use some of that um, grant funding from like social emotional learning for HVAC equipment? Uh, we can email it or I don't know if we want to have, I can yield the rest of my time for the discussion if that's okay. No, I, again, we, we can't have this conversation. We can, okay. we, we should have them written down as he's doing. So you can get a, give a call to them to um, get that information. I mean, yeah, I mean, going back and forth, just, we just can't do that. Uh, okay. okay. So I guess the only other thing I would say is that perhaps maybe in the future, um, if the committee could request having anticipated start and end dates for those projects that you mentioned on page 25, so that at least we as the public can understand when and where these projects are gonna happen in the school that could help us plan for activities, events, street closures, whatever it is. I think that that would help clarify when these are actually gonna be completed as well. We can look into that, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Sofia Pinto, 619 Elm Street. I just have to say it is very um, concerning to hear that there's going to be a vote on a $50 million budget and that there's no discussion or answers, answers to questions that the public has today um, and that the board is going to be voting. So I want to echo what was said earlier, that if there's going to be a vote on a budget, there should be an opportunity for people to raise questions for those questions to be answered. Thank you. I'd like to answer that, that we've had several meetings on the budget um, and we had two people come and it's been advertised, right? Hi, 
Hi, Kathleen Piva again. Uh, just one question, maybe prior to when you're submitting the information for the Board of Ed meeting, it might be a good idea to have an open availability for us to submit questions in advance for the budget or for other items, and then you'd be able to answer them here. Just a thought. Thank you. Seeing none, I'll close the public portion to the budget. As now we'll move on to the uh, agenda items on the personnel one through 26 and addenda items one through three. Number one, appointment of district superintendent. Two, NJSIA participation. Three, additional lunch proctor. Four, additional standard based instructional support program. Five, medical leave. Six, we send staff appointment. Seven, staff appointment. Eight, staff resigna resignation. Nine, change of assignment transfer. 10, district substitute. 11, district uh, director of special services. 12, maternity leave of absence. 13, school nurse. 14, curric curriculum writing. 15, additional educational service contract. 16, paraprofessional additional hours. 17, summer enrichment math literacy program. 18, diagnostic assign assessment. 19, a preschool parent workshop. 20, summer camp staffing, staffing list. 21, additional curriculum writing. 22, intern affiliation agreement. 23, early college program. 24, 2023 ESY program. 25, summer 2023 child study team personnel. 26, maternity leave replacement. And agenda items, number one, staff resignation, two, ESY additions, uh, and three, power, uh, power, professional development. And I thought there was four. Okay, do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have any discussion on any of the items? Yes, President Harms. I just would like to say uh, in regards to item number eight, um, Mrs. Judith, ne bleh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Judith Niece, I just would like to say that I'm so sorry to see her go, but um, I wish her all the best. Thank you. Any other discussion on any item? Hearing none, roll call, please. Vice President Baimante. Yes. Susan Costum. Yes, but I recuse myself from item number one under personnel. Mr. Figueroa? Yes. Cindy Mago? Yes. Jennifer McCarr? Yes. Chris Monroe? Yes. Constance Quintella? Yes, but unfortunately, I'm also forced to recuse myself from number one due to school ethics guidelines. President Harms? Yes. Motion carries. At this time, um, I will take the privilege to introduce Ms. Patricia Gorse as our new superintendent. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Garrido, Board President, Mr. Harms. Vice President, Mr. Bayamonte, board members, Ms. Kostrom, Ms. Magel, Ms. Kirkland, Ms. Quintella, Mr. Monroe, Ms. McCarr, and Ms. Figueredo. Good evening, community members, family, friends, colleagues, and staff. I apologize. It is with great honor, pride, and humility that I accept the position of superintendent of Roselle Park School District. Though I will miss middle school, my students, and parents, and as this marks my 23rd year in education, five of which have been in this wonderful town that has been my home for the past 15 and a half years. The remainder 18 years of my career have been in my prior district and town of Newark. I began my public school education in this great country as a young 10 year old student in the Newark public schools who could barely speak any English. Though a tough adjustment, 
it was one that has come to teach me a lifelong lesson. From it, I have endured great strength, upheld my family values, and gained humility. My love for education was always present from a young age in a common language between my birthplace of Portugal and the country I proudly chose to be a citizen of. I am so lucky to have been given this opportunity and to proudly live up to the American dream, the dream that so many of our ancestors came to pursue, all of which guided my choices, choices to live up to what my parents instilled in me, that only through hard work, dedication, and determination could we achieve personal and professional success. Now, I stand before you as the adult who went through the public school system education and that has vowed to stand as a role model for all students that by making the right choices, upholding values, being determined and committed, the possibilities are endless. I want to be a role model for all students, showing them that hard work, commitment, and determination will lead them on the path of being economically independent and productive members of our society. I want to make sure that all students are given the same opportunities and provided with the very best education as they go through our Roselle Park schools so that one day, one of them can stand where I am today and know that it was thanks to all their educators, their family, and their own determination and commitment that they have reached their ultimate career goal. I look forward to working with this esteemed board to ensure that all Roselle Park students and their families see that we work together to ensure that every child's needs that live in the district are met. Together, we will continue to foster and maintain community partnerships in order to address crucial responsibilities and matters that will only continue to develop our school system and make our community great. Together, we will work hard to ensure that all students receive the best education possible, as, con as well as continue to maintain our schools well protected. Furthermore, we will work together to ensure that we support and build on our in-house staff members respective qualities so that they can continue to help in our endeavor and main goal of ensuring that once our students leave our district, they are equipped to face any academic path that they choose. Having had the pleasure to serve as our school district as a middle school principal, it has given me firsthand insight on all the greatness that exists within our very own staff and one which I want to see grow and make even more impact in the lives of our students. Though I can stand here and speak to you all for hours on what we will accomplish together, I'd rather leave that to showing you when I begin my new position as superintendent on July 1st. Thank you all for your confidence in me, and I'm eager and excited to continue to work with you all in the Roselle Park School District under my new role. I would be remiss if I did not thank my family who is here for me today, but who has always been there and has been my biggest cheerleaders. To my staff and friends who have taken the time to come out tonight to show their support, I am forever grateful and blessed to have you all in my life. Last but not least, thank you again to you, the board members, to you, the parents, for believing in me and my qualities and for affording me this opportunity. I look forward to working with you all as I know together we will continue to do great things in Roselle Park School District and build a more unified and strong school system. Thank you all. What's that? Wait. A <laughs> Gotta wait. Yeah. <laughs> at this at this time, um, I would like to introduce Heather Gilgallen as special <laughs> director of special services. Ms. Gallen, if you'd like to just say a few words. That is a very very difficult speech to follow, uh, and I don't have anything prepared that lengthy. Um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Heather Gilgallen. Um, as I had shared with the board prior this evening, um, I'm a social worker by trade. Um, my passion is to make sure the needs of the children are met. I have been in the world of clinical 
and when I moved into schools, I have served as a case manager. I have been a supervisor of special services. I have had the honor and privilege of serving on my town's board of ed for the last seven years. So I know all of the hard work that you've all put in every meeting, every day. It is not just an hour a week. Um, and I'm also the parent of a child with an IEP. So I make a promise to all of the parents with children that have IEPs. And I've made this promise from day one as a case manager when I used to sit in IEP meetings. I will never make a recommendation that if it was not my child there, my first thought is what would I do if this was Michael? So I promise to all the parents to do my best to serve your children, to provide them with what they need to be successful and to really be a part of this community. Thank you for welcoming me. Thank you. As we move on into education agenda items 27 through 33, 27, 2023, 2024, district first, first aid procedures, physician standing orders, 28 harassment, intimidation, bullying incidents, 29 tuition agreement, 30 ESY education program, 2023, 31 field trip requests, 32 education programs, 33 conference attendance request. Do I have a motion? Make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing no, none, roll call please. Vice no. President Baimante. Yes. Susan Carstone. Yes. Lisa Figueredo. Yes. Cindy Mago. Yes. Jennifer McCarr. Yes. Chris Monroe. Yes. Constance Quintella. Yes. President Harms. Oh, yes. Larry, drink it. Okay. Under business, agenda items 34 through 47 and agenda item four. 34, monthly certifications, 35, approval of bills, 36, approval of minutes, 37, secretary treasurer's report, 38, budget transfers, 39, district medical service agreement, 40, tuition rates, 41, grant application and acceptance, 42, 23, 24, food service contract renewal, 43, adoption of the 23, 24 financial bu budget approval, 44, use of buildings and grounds. 45, reserve auction of equipment and supplies. 46, federal grants amendment. 47, safety grant application and agenda item four, grant application. Do I have a motion? Motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call please. Vice well, President Paul Baimante. Yes, and I recuse myself from 44M. 44 only? Mm -hmm. Susan Costone? Yes. Lucy Figueredo? Yes. Cindy Mago? Yes. Jennifer McCarr? Yes. Chris Monroe? Yes. Constance Quintella? Yes. President Harms? Yes. Motion carries. We'll move on to continuing business. Do we have any? Right, yep, 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 yep. Okay, hearing none, um, we'll move into the last public participation. Anyone wishing to speak, please come forward, <coughs> state your name and where you're from, and you have three minutes to speak. Hi again, Katie McDermott, Roselle Park, New Jersey. Uh, first, I wanted to welcome Mrs. Gilgallen. Um, I am one of the co-leaders of the District CPAC. My, one of my other co-leaders is back there, Ms. Jackie Garcia. So welcome, we look forward to working with you. I also want to say congratulations to Principal Goyce, like tears, tears, so excited, thank you. Um, I did want to make um, two comments. Uh, President Harms, I was at both of the budget meetings and there were more than two people there. In addition, the budget information provided at those meetings is not adequate enough for us to ask informed questions. Like I didn't know at those meetings that the special education instruction budget was going down 7%. I didn't know that until the advertised budget was posted, okay? 
Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is that while you're not required to answer any questions that we, we ask up here, you are not prohibited from doing so. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Mrs. Perez, Rosal Park, New Jersey. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone here. Um, congratulations to our leaders. We believe in you and we look forward to collaborating. I wanted to share some good news and um, just let you know that many, if not all of the schools in our district received a grant called um, the, from the Union County called Kids Dig In. So please stay tuned for that. Uh, Robert Gordon will be building May 22nd and planting May 24th. Please save the dates and follow up with us for a time to join us for that event. I encourage parents to get involved and ask our board members to find grants that will continue to help us build our amazing community. Let's work together. Let's remember that diversity is a fact. Equity is a choice. Inclusion is an action and belonging is an outcome. Quería decirles gracias a todos por estar aquí hoy. Estoy aquí para compartir buenas noticias. Varias de nuestras escuelas han recibido una beca. Y las escuelas es una beca para jardín, tener un jardín. En el condado de Union nos ha ayudado a construir y mantener un jardín aquí. Y la escuela de Robert Gordon va a construir el 22 de mayo y plantar el 24 de mayo. Guarde las fechas y manténgase en atento para unirse con nosotros. Animo a los padres que sean parte de las actividades y le pido a los miembros que busquen becas que nos ayuden a continuar en construyendo la increíble comunidad que tenemos. Vamos a trabajar juntos. Recuerden que la diversidad es un hecho. La equidad es una lección. La inclusión es una acción. Y la pertenencia es el resultado. Thank you. Uh, Lavender McCaffrey, Roselle Park. Some of you may have heard that recently a substitute teacher was fired from the Roselle Park school system. That substitute is me. Since the board has provided no transparency regarding this, I am here to be that transparency. While working in the schools, it became clear to me that transphobic attitudes were affecting how I was perceived and that there were attempts to suggest I hide my trans identity. Not long after, I received a notice that implied I was going to be fired. I scheduled a meeting with the superintendent Garrido, which he turned into a so-called hearing, completely against the process described in the notice, in which I was too shocked to interpret. He told me I was going to be fired, that there was nothing I could do about it, that it was best I keep it mostly secret and refrain from discussing it in a public session, and that I should find work in another school system. At the same time, I was also fired from a program I was asked to create at the local recreation center in a paranoid domino effect. When I attempted to attend the official hearing promised in the notice with a lawyer, I was denied. Superintendent Garrido has therefore broken the law by knowingly firing an employee due to transphobic sentiment, attempting to hide it, and backing it up with a dubious policy to avoid an obvious discrimination case. The policy was used as a pretext. Certain pictures from my social media were used against me and were largely private, meaning that I've been targeted for existing. This decision has erased a visibly trans individual from the school system, a dangerous strike against trans children, and has caused me trauma that has made each day since its own special hell. The children of this town have accepted me as a trans woman with such openness, and I have never felt safer and more loved for who I am than at the Roselle Park summer camp. Language cannot describe the pain I feel as someone who worked there for 11 years, providing support and confidence to every child I worked with, who gave devoted attention to those with special needs, and my heartbreak is that of someone torn suddenly from their family. But I don't keep secrets. Anyone in this room, board members included, may approach me and discuss how we can address this and appeal the process. I legally recorded my meeting with the superintendent, and you may have a copy of the transcript if you like. The healing power of trans visibility for the next generation is indispensable. To cut this healing off at its root is a form of abuse, as is any limiting of diversity in public education. For example, when I disappeared from the rec center, they, in shock, nearly kept parents from attending the show my coworker and I had prepared. The children were afraid I was sick or hurt and dedicated the show to me. They didn't even know I was banned from attending. This is the kind of world those responsible have chosen to foster, where trans educators are thrown out like garbage, 
their livelihood is targeted and ridiculed, in which cowardice, erasure, and cosmically bad judgment are immediate reactions. But know that above everything is my desire to appeal this decision, revise policy, and work it out before the Roselle Park School System cements its participation in the nationwide genocide of trans people. Okay, sorry, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Melinda Muka, and I live in Roselle Park. Lavender McCaffrey is my daughter, and I'm extremely proud of her. She eloquently expressed the humil humiliation, pain, and trauma that the school board and the borough have inflicted on her. These emotions are felt by her family as well. I cannot tell you how difficult it is for me as a mother to see my own daughter targeted, victimized, and erased simply because of who she is. The words that do come to mind are hate, lies, cynicism, deceit, and cowardice. We saw this in the transphobic complaints leveled against her when she became a substitute teacher. We saw this in the manip manipulative way that her firing was handled. We saw this in the fact that no one in the borough, not our elected council people, nor our mayor, had the courtesy and common decency to even respond to my husband's and my inquiries. We saw this in the way the board's social media policy was blatantly twisted, clearly violating her First Amendment rights. The superintendent's letter recommending her firing refers to the so-called deleterious impact her social media has had on the district. How do we reconcile that with the fact that her performance as a substitute teacher in special needs classes was actually complimented? I find it reprehensible that my daughter's social media account, which is solely for her art and music, was used as a weapon against her, yet members of this board are allowed to use their social media to frame their hateful lies about transgender individuals in the guise of protecting our children, a clear violation of the school board's code of ethics. Does this not have a deleterious impact on our district? Yet nothing has been done. And we continue to see deceit and cowardice in the way that the board and the borough are now concealing their actions by not releasing all pertinent information, despite the fact that we have legally requested it. Those who are LGBTQ plus and their families, friends, and allies are hit every single day with a barrage of hate at the state and federal level. I refuse to sit by and let this happen in the community that I've lived in for 35 years. I refuse to let my daughter erased. I refuse to let our voices be silenced. This is not over. Hi, I'm um, Mariel Pasqua. I live in Roselle Park. I didn't write anything for today, unlike last month. I'm pretty much here to kind of reiterate the same thing. Um, Jen McCard tried to block my Twitter account, but um, you failed. I could still see it, but you, you also can't block me from these meetings. So here I am um, to kind of echo what Miss Lavender's mom said. You posted, stop forcing your religion on me. I do not believe in gender ideology. That is not my belief. Separation of church and state, right? The state can't force its religion on me. Did you ever consider like not running for the Board of Ed? Because your responsibility to these students um, is a lot more than just like the straight cisgender students. Like you have a responsibility to all the students. And even though you decided to call uh, transgender students mentally ill um, a few months ago on that same Twitter account. I just want to remind you that mentally ill students also like deserve your compassion and your care as a board member. I, I like, what are you even saying? I, I'm sorry, I really didn't have anything repair, uh, prepared. I did meet with Miss Lavender. I, I didn't know her prior to all this drama. Um, she's a beautiful person and I actually made a, a great new friend. We, I actually, expected to hang out with her for maybe uh 30 minutes so we met at a bakery and we actually wound up hanging out for five hours that night because she's just a beautiful person aside from the fact that she seems to be victimized by the process i'm just going to remind everyone here that every transgender student in this school system had to face a loss at her not um being represented in the classroom they can't can no longer look up to her 
and see someone um, see themselves in a, in a leader. And I, I find that truly sad and problematic. I, I really call on you to do better for our students in this town. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Shane McCaffrey and I live at 51 West Clay. Um, I have, Melinda and I moved into Roseau Park in 1987 and we're your neighbors. We bought our house and we're just like everybody else in this town. Um, we invested in our house, took, looked after our house, renovated it. And in 1995, we had a child, Lavender. And Lavender went to school, the Robert Gordon School across the way. When she was little, she used to come home for lunch in our house. It was really neat. Fourth grade, she picked up an instrument. She goes, oh, I want to learn an instrument. I thought she was going to do the flute. She took the drum. I was like, oh, I don't want you to take the drum. Why did you do the drum? <laughs> and and she went to Mr. Masucci, who still lives down the road, and taught everybody to learn how to play drums in this town for the last 30 years and took private lessons. And then Lavender went over to the middle school, was in the bell choir, was in the, org with, was in the band, and in the choir over there, hit the county chorus. And then Lavender went to the high school, and she really prospered. She was on that stage right behind you. She sang and danced and did comedy. She was a star at the high school here. She was in the marching band. She was a great drummer. We were marching band pants. I got the jacket right over there. You can look at it. I still wear it around town. And she was a great drummer. We, were, we did all the fundraising. We went to every event. We went to Hershey with her. And we sat over there in the high school. And she played drums to support the football team every Friday night. And then she graduated. She was the top music student in Roselle Park High School. She went down the Rutgers. But she didn't stop being part of Roselle Park. She worked for you, the Board of Ed. Would have been 12 years this summer if you hadn't canned her. She, would have, she worked in the summer camp and the theater camp. And she loved the kids in this town. And so this past winter, she didn't have a job. And my wife said, oh, why don't you get a job as a substitute teacher? Because you need a job. And Roselle Park is short of teachers and substitute teachers. So she comes and gets a job as a substitute teacher. And she didn't even last a month, not even a month, because transphobic hating parents in Aldine and Robert Gordon called up and said, get rid of her. So they come in and harassed our daughter and got her fired. So I want to know why. Why do you persecute my daughter? Why do you persecute my family? She's a daughter of this town. I'm your neighbor. I took the train with you, Mr. Harms. We both work in this town. I took the train to support my family. What did you do to us? Why do you support hateful people instead of decent people? What is wrong with you? Thank you. Jennifer McCool, I live in Roselle Park. Um, I think it's very sad that um, we did lose a beautiful transgender person in our town. However, I have to share a different light on this. So I have two teenage daughters and um, I try to teach them that social media is a great thing, but also a terrible tool as well. I tell them not to take pictures with red solo cups because it looks like you're drinking alcohol. Not to take pictures uh, in provocative poses because it looks like you're doing things that you shouldn't be as a teenager. Unfortunately, my, um, my children and their friends shared images that they found very easily on social media of this person we're speaking of. These pictures were disturbing to say the least. And I'm all for the First Amendment and I'm all for art. However, if, if you're going to be around children, the pictures that I saw were extremely disturbing. And if that's the picture you're portraying of yourself, I don't think that the people in this town and on in our board would want you to be next to the children. They were sexually provocative. They were showing violence and they were very disturbing as a parent. And so there is another side of this. I don't care if, you know, someone in a 
cookie monster outfit is teaching my child. I don't care what you look like or dress like or who you claim to be because inclusion is what we should all teach and what we should all preach. But the pictures that were shared on social media, I think brought up a different light to this. And if it was easy for my children to find it, I'm sure this was shared throughout town. And I'm sorry this came and happened to you. I, I truly am because I think that having a transgender person in the education system in Roselle Park only teaches and fosters more inclusion. But as I taught my children that social media is a terrible thing sometimes, I think it's come down to, to haunt you, unfortunately. And I'm sorry for that. Edward Gade, 710 Hamilton Place, Roselle Park. Actually, tonight I'm dropping the complaint with the district and uh, the middle school. And uh, nothing to say is uh, about good job. Uh, we focused together, we moved on. I'm very happy. And uh, I want to thank Ms. Q, very focused, very understanding on the job. Uh, I want to congratulate Ms. Uh, Goyes for the new position. I'm sure she's a good uh, successor for Mr. Garrido. And uh, I, uh, I see and I believe Ms. Q is a good successor for her. I hope this happened. And uh, regarding my complaint with Robert Gordon, um, I want to exclude Ms. Perez from the com complaint. And everything else stays the same. Uh, I hope uh, some improvement happen. And uh, hopefully next meeting I can drop this complaint too. Thank you. Mark Fernandez, 114 Locust Street. School boards should not be places where political ideology is the motivation to hire and fire staff. Phrases like for the kids or moms for change have been a ruse. We didn't vote for members to use their political will to ensure that their friends gain advantages in our district, but it's what we have now. We have five board members who vote their party line, not for the interests of parents or children, but for their own interests and their own idea of what the district should be. They fired a longtime board attorney and hired a well-known right-leaning firm who's represented Republicans throughout New Jersey in lawsuits against districts a firm that needed to Google Roberts rules while deciding whether or not they could table an issue. The board has set aside 152,000 taxpayer dollars for this. This board led by Ms. Quintella is looking to destroy the progress that has been made in this district and in Robert Gordon for the last three years. She and her board colleagues are looking not to renew the contract of our principal, our principal who has been a steady leader for the past three years, her leadership and management has changed the culture of Robert Gordon. Surveys have proven that the majority of parents and teachers are happy at the school. There's always room for improvement. However, I believe Ms. Hanau has laid a foundation and deserves to continue to build a school community, which is what she was hired to do. Our PTA received an award on Sunday, the award from the NJPTA for Plan STEM Day where students could experience science-related hands-on activities, it came together because of the efforts of Ms. Hanau and our PTA. If this board can't see the work, the effort and the time put in by a principal and her staff, maybe they should stop posting on social media and do the work they were elected to do. Mike Lanregan, Roselle Park. Um, before I begin, I just want to say congratulations, Ms. Kois. We're so happy to have you, and we know you're going to do great things. Uh, it is deeply concerning that a member of the Roselle Park Board of Education has been publicly posting anti-transgender, anti-public school, and anti-social emotional learning remarks on social media. It is just as concerning that most of the board members do not seem concerned at all about this. You as board members are here to support all students, not just the few that you choose to support. Supporting LGBTQ and other marginalized students in the post-pandemic era involves creating a safe and inclusive environment for students that supports their mental health and well-being. 
Spreading lies and misinformation about marginalized communities can have serious and harmful consequences. Hate speech has no place in our schools or our community. Jen McCarr and anyone else on the board who aligns themselves with her should resign. Our students and school staff deserve better. And since some board members seem to be confused about social emotional learning, I'd like to clarify. Social emotional learning refers to the process of developing the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that allow individuals to manage their emotions, establish positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. It is not indoctrination. Multiple peer-reviewed studies, such as this, the one by Brackett et al., suggest that social emotional learning is even more important in the post-pandemic era as students face increased stress, anxiety, and trauma. Social emotional interventions can help students develop resilience, cope with stress, and learn to maintain positive relationships. Additionally, social emotional learning can improve academic outcomes and support overall well-being. Perhaps some board members would benefit from some social emotional learning themselves. Thank you. Hello, Kathleen Piva again, 124 Union Road. Can you speak into the mic, please? Oh, sorry. Thank you. No, it's too low. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. All right, so um, along with Mark, I wanted to pledge my support again for Mrs. Hanau, who is the Robert Gordon um, principal. Um, last month at the Board of Ed meeting, some of the members said on the hot mic, they're unclear why we keep talking about it, but some of the members are trying to push her out for their own personal agenda. There were no Board of Ed concerns to remove a principal who was unethical and not paying for family to attend the school or the principal who was harassing women teachers daily. So I think it's unacceptable to try to push out a principal who's well-loved, bilingual, who increased parent presence as well as obtaining new grants, increasing le reading levels and test scores. I think Mrs. Hanau does deserve to get tenure and if I need to start a petition, I most definitely will. Now again, I'm begging the Board of Ed to review posts on social media by Jen McCart. Um, I'm unclear why the board has no interest in doing so after two months of people continually coming to meetings and complaining. She has made multiple anti-LGBTQ posts on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook through multiple accounts, and many are still out there for your viewing pleasure. Ms. McCarr made a post on 316 saying it's not about her and said her religious beliefs and character have been attacked. Unfortunately, she is making anti-LGBTQ posts, so it is about her. She does not care to support every single child, regardless of their ability, race, creed, sex, social standing, as required per your Board of Ed oath. She posted, this is about the young ones who felt they can't express their true beliefs in school because the truth is, if you don't agree with these extremists, you get canceled. The kids do express their true beliefs in school because they feel safe here. The teachers and the staff care about them and their feelings, and you're the one looking to cancel the children as well as even staff, based on their beliefs, how they feel, how they want to dress, and how they want to be called. Everyone has a legal right to be who they want to be, even if it may be different for you. Now, I've been a practicing Catholic my whole life, teacher of CCD. I've never brought church into school, but I've noticed a lot of your posts are talking about God and prayer. So per John chapter 15, it says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Philippians chapter two, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, from everything that I've done with CCD and church, all of the books, Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, were all written in year 65 to 100 after Jesus died. So God and Jesus didn't write the Bible. It was written by man. It is supposed to be the word of God. God loved everybody. Jesus loved everybody. And as a member of the Board of Ed, I feel that everyone, if you're not here for every single child, regardless if they want to come to school. I'm sorry, your time people, is up. Okay, I had two minutes and 56 seconds on my phone. I have three minutes and seven seconds. Okay, that's fine. At this time, I will close the public portion. Uh, if there, what? 
Huh? Is Patricia Reese here? The uh, invading dangerous figures? Well, we will <laughs> in, in, in a minute. Ms. Reese? Okay. You're up. Um, oh, yes, yeah, she is. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, relax. Relax, guys. Relax. Holy smokes. <laughs> You're killing me here. Yes. Okay. Okay. You can make that statement. It's on. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a response to the various comments this evening. The board is unable to discuss or provide any comment about personnel matters involving current or former employees. The board rejects any notion that the district has discriminated against any current or former employee in any way based upon age, sex, gender, identity, sexual orientation, race, creed, color, marital status, familial status, mental or physical disability, and religion or national origin. The district takes seriously its obligations to comply with all laws, including but not limited to the New Jersey law against discrimination. Thank you. Uh, at this time, what we have is we have our ethics um, yearly training. Um, the public is welcome to stay. Um, if not, we're going to just take a five minute break so we can kind of stretch our legs, um, and come back. So what time is it right now? It's, uh, 828. 828. How about 835? Um, ladies and gentlemen in the back, if you don't mind moving it out to the hallway, I'd appreciate that. We're going to have some training here. So if you could just move it out to the hallway. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me tonight to do your annual uh, ethics training. Um, I gave you each a packet, and so there's information in there. In addition to the PowerPoint slides, there's some backup information that you could read and on your own time. Uh, this is pretty um, dry stuff, unfortunately. It has to be done. Uh, you get QSEC points. You lose QSEC points if you don't do that, uh, if you don't do your tr ethics training. So I am Patty Reese. I am a field service rep for New Jersey School Boards Association. I handle uh, Middlesex Union in Hudson counties. And this is the kinds of things that we do. We provide trainings for the board. Um, I start with a disclaimer uh, about this training. It in no way represents legal advice. Uh, it's informational only and um, the application and impact of laws can vary widely based on specific facts involved. If you have any questions or concerns about specific cases or facts, uh, I urge you to contact and have a discussion with your board attorney. So ethics provides for accountability of board members. Uh, public service is about serving all of the people, including the ones who are not like you. Uh, as a school official, you have the honor of serving the interests of the public. In carrying out that duty, how do you, how do boards, how do board members hold themselves accountable to the public that you serve? And is it any different than when you were a volunteer? In 1991, the legislature uh, 
uh, approved the School Ethics Act, which uh, in essence says it is essential that the conduct of members of local boards of education and local administrators hold the respect and confidence of the people. These board members and administrators must avoid conduct, which is in violation of their public trust, or which creates a justifiable impression among the public that such trust is being violated. So the School Ethics Act is a standard of ethical conduct that was approved by the legislature. There are several parts of the School Ethics Act that apply, some apply to all school officials and some apply only to board members and, and charter school trustees. So um, the, the conflicts of interest and the disclosure statements are provisions that apply to all uh, school officials. That includes, as I said, board members, charter school trustees, school administrators. We at NJSBA must abide by that and provide every year a conflict of interest uh, or the disclosure statement. The provisions that apply only, the provisions of the School Ethics Act that, that apply only to board members are the code of ethics and the mandatory training requirement. These are the different things that the School Ethics Act has um, established, what a, de a definition of what it considers a conflict of interest, what the mandatory requi training requirements are. Uh, it also um, put into place a School Ethics Commission uh, and the Code of Ethics, and what the, the disclosure statements and the personal and financial and relative, um, how they look. These are just the different tenets of, of the um, Code of Ethics. This talks about um, up, upholding and enforcing all the laws, rules, and regulations of the state of New Jersey and uh, regulations by the Department of Ed Education. Uh, underneath are the stand, what's listed as the standards or what the School Ethics Commission considers when they're looking uh, to see if a violation has occurred. And rather than read these all individually, um, you, you'll have it in your packet um, uh, for you to go through. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase what they're about. This one talks about making decisions that are in the best interests of all students. C talks about uh, confining the board, your action to board action, confining the board action to policy making. Um, you know, I will confine my board action to policy making, planning, and appraisal. Item D, tenant or tenant D, um, is you will, and you probably hear hear this a lot that you will carry out your responsibility not to administer the schools, but together with your fellow board members to see that they are well run. This one talks about that the authority rests with the full board and that you will make no personal promises or majority, the authority rests with the um, majority of the board um, only at a uh, noticed meeting with a, with a quorum present. This one is hard not, it's hard to paraphrase those. So you will refuse to surrender your independent judgment to special interest or partisan political groups or use the schools for personal gain or for the gain of friends. Tenet G talks about confidentiality and holding all matters pertaining to the schools uh, confidential. H is talking about appointing the best qualified personnel available after consider consideration of the recommendation of the superintendent um, uh, of schools or the chief administrative officer. So you hire as a board, you hire one employee, and that is the uh, superintendent. Uh, you hold the superintendent accountable, and the superintendent uh, holds all the staff accountable. I talks to uh, protecting school personnel and the proper performance of their duties. And the final uh, tenant J talks to the chain of command that you will refer all complaints to the superintendent and will act on the complaints at public meetings 
only after the failure of an administrative solution. These are some decisions, and I know it's late, so I'll, uh, instead of reading through them, and, and uh, you can read through them uh, uh, you know, on your off time. They are recent dishes, decisions. They were, uh, most were done in uh, 2022. Uh, this, um, and, and it identifies what tenets of the uh, code of ethics are violated. Uh, if you want, I can go through them, or I know it's late, so. I was just gonna run through it. <laughs> I see Lauren going like that. Um, this is another group. Uh, these are uh, uh, SEC decisions as opposed to advisory opinions. So decisions are, uh, and we'll talk to who can ask for, who can apply for or file a, a complaint and who can file, ask for advisory opinions. Uh, a lot of what goes on in, in school boards is deter defining what is a what is a conflict of interest. Uh, this is, uh, if you have a conflict of interest, you should recuse yourself from any uh, discussion or vote uh, regarding that issue. This talks about, um, and the, the, there's a list, A through F, talks about the different things that may uh, give you a conflict of interest. Um, such as if you have a business interest or a professional activity uh, that comes before the board, um, it, it, you know, it, it's just if there's anything that you might or might be perceived that you get um, uh, financial gain, then you should recuse yourself. In, uh, in the end of January, new regulations came out from the Department of Ed regarding um, the School Ethics Commission uh, or the, the proposed definition. So what you see and, and here are the, the different qualifications uh, before February 1st is when this world were all took effect. Up above the, the first, the top tells you what the, um, what they defined, the School Ethics Commission defined as a, uh, an immediate family member. Down below, you'll see the difference at what's, hot, what's, whoops. I'm a page ahead. There we go. I'm sorry. Um, down below, you have um, the what's in red is what are the new additions. So before a an immediate family member was considered, they defined as spouse or dependent child residing within the same household. Now the um, the new definition says that spouse, civil union partner, and adds, you know, domestic partner or, or any dependent child residing in the same household. A dependent child was just a child claimed as a dependent on your federal and state uh, income taxes, tax forms. Uh, the, the difference moving forward now is it's federal or state. So before it could be both, now it has to be, it can be one or the other. Uh, and then the the greater definition of who is uh, added to who is a relative, um, and it really before it was pretty it was hard to to figure out if this person uh, um, was um, a had a relationship as for the School Ethics Act. Now you see how extensive that list is, and this comes into effect or it has an impact um, with hiring of personnel. You may not hire a relative of a board member or a school superintendent, chief school administrator. Um, you can't, t and however, as a board member or even as a new superintendent, as you just hired one tonight, if they already come into the position with Pete, they have a relative that works in the district, uh, so they, they, they've accounted for that. Like, so that just because you have a relative in the district doesn't mean you can't run for board of ed. Um, and so if you have a relative in the district, the administrator may not exercise direct or indirect authority over the relative um, of the administrator. A board member may not take part in any employment matters concerning the superintendent or supervisors in the chain of command between that relative and the superintendent, and that a board member cannot 
take part in the search selection or vote to hire a new superintendent and the post hire evaluations and contract discussions. What that means is you can't take part in the discussion and you can't vote on it. As far as collective bargaining goes, this chart tells you if you have uh, who the relative may be and what you can and can't do. So if the relation, the first column, the relationship to the board member, if any of those people are or have a relationship with you and work in the district, you cannot participate in negotiations and you cannot uh, take part in the vote to ratify the contract. If yourself, if you as a board member or an, uh, an administrator or your spouse or dependent child works out of district, you can participate in negotiations, but you can take part in the ratification uh, vote after the memorandum of agreement, salary guides, and total compensation package have been agreed to and barring any other um, conflicts that you may have. And if your child is not or not dependent relative works out of district, then you can take part in both. Again, always absent any other um, conflicts. This just talks about some other potential conflicts. Uh, if you're not if the relative is not in the unit, but the terms of their contract are linked to the union, um, then you should not participate in negotiate in, 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 you should recuse yourself from the, from the negotiations. Um, if you are supervised or they are supervised by somebody in the unit, the same thing. Um, and if a, a family member, immediate family member or relative has heightened union involvement. What does that mean? If they are not in the district, but they are in another district and they're in a leadership position in the union or the same union that's in yours, uh, in your district, uh, or they're uh, uh, in a leadership position on the state level, then you should not take part in negotiations. And these are some more. This is another SEC decision. This one's about taking, making decisions in the best interest. And just I'll, I'll, I'll just point out in the bottom, it, in the red, it lists what the violation is. So this is C, um, a violation of tenant C, and the penalty was a reprimand. Um, the penalty recommended by the School Ethics Commission. Then it goes to... Um, and the commissioner and the commissioner has issued a final decision. So this person was reprimanded. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about what the different levels of penalties are. And these are uh, these are school ethics commission decisions, um, as well as this one. And then there's the other thing uh, that the School Ethics Commission does is issue advisory opinions. A, an advisory opinion can be requested by a member of the Board of Education or by the school official uh, before an action takes place or of in, in, in asking about an anticipated action, whether it was um, um, uh, a, a potential violation. And in this first one, it's just that a board member is a bus driver in another district. They do not pay do dues to the local NJAEA affiliate, and they really want to know, can they participate in negotiations? Uh, and the uh, advisory opinion issued is that no, they shouldn't because it's the same union all around, um, the same NJEA. And so that's a potential conflict. Um, this one I, I just is, is interesting where board members, the, the next one down, voted on the super, the board vote on the superintendent miracles uh, was defeated. Two members could not participate because their spouses worked in the district. The superintendent resigned. If the, the board, the question is, if the board revotes on the merit goals, can these two members participate since the former superintendent is no longer an employee? And the ethics commission said no. The, the conflict is still there regard because it's the same person. It's the same superintendent, regardless of whether they're in the district or not. And some more, um, and these get into the weeds, really. Um, and, 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 you know, talking about an ex-spouse that doesn't, that, uh, 
can they vote, uh, can they participate in negotiations? The next one is about an Anton law. I think the um, the ex-spouse is interesting in that um, the the um, there is a custodial and child, there's a child, I'm sorry, a custodial and a spousal support agreement between the, the two spouses, uh, the ex-spouses, um, but by definition, by the SEC definition, the ex-spouse is not considered a family member. Um, the SEC said that, yes, it is still a, a conflict, or it could reasonably be perceived that an indirect or indirect personal or financial involvement exists that may impact the objectivity and may yield unwarranted privileges to the ex-spouse, since there are spousal and, and custodial um, support agreement. And the, the Anton law is always um, how far down into the weeds do you go? So public advisory opinions, um, and, and this just is four separate opinions um, with board members who either work or volunteer in organizations that um, work or interface with the board. And then on the side, uh, the other side, um, the, the bulk um, decision is organizations not under control of, overseen by, or otherwise managed by the board or the district is not a per se conflict in general. And then there's just the, the, the different ways that it pertains to each individual situation. We'll go on to um, what training is mandatory. And this has changed what is mandatory or the timelines have changed as of February 1st with the, with, uh, the, chapter, cha tw the chapter 28 uh, policy um, uh, regulations that have been re that were revised. So by if you were sworn in in January of uh, this year, you have a full year to complete your your governance one, your man your mandated training of governance one, which include those topics. If you were sworn in after February first and moving forward in that first year, you will have ninety days to complete your mandated training. Uh, it, it's it's it, that that's a huge difference. No longer do you have a year. However, for your governance two, your year two, your year three, and each year of your re-election year, you still have a full year to complete that training. And we do provide training, as it says there, in person, live virtual, and a self-paced online. And they will be offered far more frequently, especially Governance One, because of um, this new regulation. So what is the timeline for um, disclosure statements? If you're a new school official, uh, you have 30 days from the date of that you start employment or the date that you're sworn in to do your first disclosure statement. After that, every year you have April 30th. By April 30th, you have to uh, complete your disclosure statements, and those will arrive to you from the directly an email from the Department of Ed. This talks about, this slide shows you uh, what the School Ethics Commission is. It's nine appointed members uh, appointed by the governor for a three-year term, uh, and it stipulates that you cannot have more than five people from any one party. So there are five non-school officials, two school administrators, and two school board members. Uh, and at this point, I don't know, can't remember the last time that the uh, School Ethics Commission was fully staffed with um, commissioners. Right now, there's there's six. We have three non-school officials, two school administrators, and one school board member. This slide talks about what the difference is between the advisory opinion and an ethics complaint. As I said, only an advisory, in an advisory opinion, only a school official can request an advisory opinion to, to <clears throat> regarding any um, proposed action. Uh, and then the ethics complaint can be filed by anyone. Um, alleging any member of the public, any anyone alleging a violation of the School Ethics Act. The advisory opinions can be made public um, if, by, if you get six votes from the SEC. 
and in any given year, the SEC um, receives 85 ethics complaints and 35 advisory opinions or that are requested. So when the SEC, when the SEC talks, looks at um, complaint, the ethics complaints, they review the facts that in light most favorable to the person complaining. Um, <clears throat> and they would also like to remind um, all board members or all members of the public that this is not an avenue to take, um, have a grudge with. If you excuse me, I just need to get a drop. Apparently, they're they're sensing that they're getting a lot of complaints um, that are people just uh, holding a a grudge fest, as I guess is what they said. Um, so, as provided by the School Ethics Act, the School Ethics Commission has several disciplinary act options to recommend to the commissioner, and they are outlined here. A reprimand is a rebuke by the commissioner that the conduct violated standards but does not result in a formal resolution. Uh, a censure is a formal disapproval by the gov by the commissioner and publicized by the adoption of a resolution in your local in your community at your local board meeting. Um, and then suspension is barred from engaging in any activity uh, for a designated period of time. De depending on the violation, the School Ethics Commission does make a recommendation to the commissioner for that period of time. And then the um, a re removal, immediate termination from board membership or employment if it's an administrator. The SEC makes the recommendations to the commissioner for final agency decision, and there is a, an appeals process in which appeals can be heard by the appellate division of the courts. The SEC will, in, in after, if they've made a decision um, and, they, and, and a recommendation, uh, they will first send an out of compliance member, board member, an order to show ca just cause as the opportunity for the board uh, member to respond as to why they should not be found in violation of uh, the School Ethics Act. And the, the, the penalty that they recommend determines on if and when the board member or the school official uh, replies. So they will recommend a censure if they had already sent out the just so show clause um, order or and before the SEC decision. Uh, so if they respond, then they may only, it might only be a censure. A suspension comes after the SEC send the just cause. They've made a decision and they've sent it to their recommendation to the um, commissioner. Uh, and so that would be a suspension. They, if the commissioner has already made their decision, then the likely, the, the, after all of that, the, the likely uh, recommendation would be removal. Now, something that's, you know, as a board member, before you were a board member, and even as you still are a board member, uh, you probably you may have been volunteering in the schools. And I've always said that board members are among your most active volunteers throughout, throughout the school. So just because you were elected as a board member doesn't mean you have to give up that volunteer activity. You just have to... Um, you just have to be mindful of the degree of involvement that you have with student and staff and um, what degree of authority that you may have as a volunteer to give directions, to give or receive directions um, to students and staff. And then just, you know, what, what if you're, um, 
just be mindful of these things. It, you know, what is the degree of giving directions or taking orders? Will you be in the building often? Will it, will it seem like you're almost a, another member of the staff? Does the volunteer activity keep you in the building that often? Are you handling school district money? Which really, if you're volunteering, let somebody else handle the district's money. Uh, it's just, just easier. Um, it's cleaner that way for you. Um, and then will you be the 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 lead volunteer uh, and the recommendation is that if you're going to volunteer at least let the superintendent know that you're in that as a courtesy so they know that you're there um, don't discuss any board related issues when you're there and just um, be you know be cognizant um, of the obligations of the act and is because it's always a, a it, the the conflict or a perceived conflict is, is what they look at. Interview committees is another one. Board members should not be on any interview committee other than that of the superintendent, unless they are invited by the superintendent. If the superintendent would like board member representation, that's fine, that, that can happen. Um, so, and the you know, recommendation is don't have more than one or two board members on the search committee, uh, don't, um, the committee should be coordinated by staff, not by the board member, uh, and the participation of a board member should be limited to observations and assessments and rec um, keeping in mind that the final recommendation is, is wholly uh, within the purview of the superintendent. Social media. Um, you know, it's it's this this you know when you are elected to school the school board you don't lose your First Amendment rights, um, but there are some just be mindful things to be mindful of. Uh, you do not violate the the act merely because of engaging in social media activities, um, but but just be mindful. Um, and the SEC when they're looking at whether. Uh, it is a violation or not, considers whether a reasonable member of the public could perceive that a school official is speaking in his or her, in their official capacity pursuant to their official duties. And, and you know, most of your community knows you're on the school board. So, um, Again, it's, it's best to be mindful of that. And if you're going to post on social media or send out emails, um, it is recommended that you use the disclaimer at the bottom of the page um, that on, on everything. Um, it's just um, essentially saying that this is your, these comments are made in your capacity as a private citizen and not your role as a board member, uh, that the statements are not representative of the board or its individual members. Uh, it, it is highly recommended by the SEC um, that you use either that one or something very close to that or one that your board attorney has, has structured for you. Um, It be the um, it, you know, because uh, your community knows your board members, they they would assume that you have more knowledge and insight than your at typical uh, uh, resident. And then just some social media reminders, if even if it's appropriate, even if the disclaimer is used, um, the substance they will look at the substance of the posting. Um, and they have, there have been some cases where they've determined that even though there was the, the, the disclaimer, uh, the substance of the posting really was, um, really did violate the law and it violate the act, act anyway. Uh, but in, in summary, when you're doing social media, um, it doesn't matter in what medium of social media the opinion is expressed, the rules are all the same. Use this SEC um, required disclaimer. Ensure that your speech meets the requirements of the School Ethics Act or the Code of Ethics. And even if the speech technically meets the requirements of the ethics law, you should ask yourself whether it would deliberately cause divisiveness or derogate from the mission of the board. And then just some points to consider. 
we recommend that POM boards develop a list of board members and administrators who may have a conflict and review it regularly. I would do that with um, your board attorney. Uh, that really comes on into um, play uh, as much when um, you start doing uh, issues with your new superintendent. Uh, also consult with your board attorney on ethics issues uh, and continue to check our school board's notes. Uh, we do post every time there are new ethics uh, advisory opinions or ethics decisions. Our, our attorneys do post, put that in, the, um, in the, um, the school board notes so it keeps you updated. And I'm not gonna read this quote. Um, this is just really uh, enclosing a statement from the School Ethics Commission about treating people with respect and working collaboratively to improve the quality and delivery of instruction to all your students. And they end with failure in this regard can have a long lasting and detrimental impact on the students, the community, the parents and the staff. And with that, if there are, these are, um, links that that give you some um, further guidance um, and if there are any uh, th this this is also in your packet it's the do the do's and don'ts of the um of the code of ethics um just almost like a, a helpful hint helpful uh reminders uh that that you can um look at oh and that's it and so if there are any questions that you hopefully you all made it through. Um, there is in your packet a, a to sign off that you had this training. Um, uh, it's either there's two two different packets here. It's either on the back of the uh, uh, on the back of a copy of the code of ethics. Just sign that and um, give it to your board to give it to your board business administrator uh, for you know reference that that you completed the training. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, board, please, board members, please um, sign the sheets before you leave tonight so we don't forget. Last year we had somebody leave and didn't sign it. So I would appreciate uh, everybody signing before they leave tonight. Um, if there's nothing else on the agenda to speak about, we do not have to go into the executive. Our next meeting is Tuesday, May 9th. At 6 p.m. will start, which will go into executive and the regular meeting will start at 7. Um, any other comments? If not, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. That motion. Do we have a second? Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Nay. And uh, everybody have a safe trip going home. Thank you. You got a pen? Sure.